This is CHSR 97.9 FM here in Fredericton, New Brunswick, Canada. This is Python's Paradise, your film and music show. And folks, this is your host, Greg Gilbert, a.k.a. the Python Hyena. And folks, I, the Breakfast Club's very, very popular here in town. In fact, I'd say over the last five years, I've seen that at least two midnight screenings. And, of course, I love Sixteen Candles, my favorite John Hughes film. Well, I have one of the actors affiliated with three of his films on the phone with me this evening. Yes, I have the wonderfully talent, ca- talented character actor, John Capellos. How do you do, John? Hello, how are you? <laughs> I'm doing fantastic. And you're Canadian. I was reading up on you. You're Canadian, huh? That's right. Don't hold it against me. Um, ha, ha, ha. Yes, I was born in London, Ontario. Okay. In uh, a long time ago, in a, you know, in in a hospital. Let me just put it that way. <laughs> <laughs> in a snowy evening in 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 March. Thirty nine years ago. Yeah, yeah. Twenty two <laughs> years ago. Oh yeah. <laughs> if only I was to be so lucky. Yeah. No, the films are even older than that. So yeah. No, <laughs> I've I've been around a little bit, but uh, such is life, you know. Yeah, I would have been in my uh, early teens when your uh, John Hughes movies came out. But uh, before we get to the John Hughes movies and uh, Roxanne and the wonderful films you made, do you want you know, like to give us a little bit of your background? Well, I was born in London mm-hmm. of um, Greek-Canadian parents. My father was born in Greece but came to Canada when he was very young. My okay. mother was born in Boston, but she of Greek of Greek uh, family, and um, I was, um, you know, raised in a really good traditional Greek Canadian home. My parents were very loving and uh, kind, and also quite strict. I was the youngest of three children. <clears throat> My father had a clothing store. Okay. My mother worked for him occasionally, and. Uh, both my parents were highly well regarded within the community. My father, <coughs> pardon me, was um, sort of in, active in the Greek Orthodox Church. My mother was one of those women who was part of the community. She was part of the Canadian Club and the, the ballet, the Royal Canadian Ballet, and uh, also the Greek Ladies Society and the American Women's Club. So she was a joiner and a member of a lot of organizations. Um, uh, my brother and sister were a bit older than I was, about five and six years. They're close in age, and they um, they they were we were all really really pressed by our father, particularly to achieve academically. And my brother and sister really uh, answered the clarion call of that. My brother uh, went to Princeton, Harvard, and Yale, and my sister went to McGill and Princeton, and. Um, they both were really sort of, uh, how should I put it, um, academically focused. In a lot of ways, I sort of kept that up, although my focus sort of shifted to more the theater and, and music world. And when I went to university, which was in Ottawa, I went to Carleton University, after three years, I sort of said, you know, I don't know whether I want to, uh, you know, become a, an English teacher or an academic or continue with my studies. So I made a bargain with my father that I wanted to start acting, and he sort of let me have a year, year and a half sort of to do that, at which time he said if I didn't get some sort of job or show that there was some sort of inclination in that direction where I could get employed, then I'd go back to college. So it was then, in that year, 1978, that I um, you know, got involved with Second City in Toronto and took workshops and got uh, met John Candy and... And from that, uh, I did extra work on SCTV, and then uh, I got a chance to meet Bernie Sollins in Chicago, who was a producer of Second City, at which point I got an audition to audition for, a chance to audition for Second City in Chicago, I should say. And I did, and then I got a job in the touring company at Second City in 1978, and um, kind of never looked back from that point. So that's sort of the different chapter. So from the age of zero to 18, I was uh, in London, Ontario, and and then I went to Ottawa, and then Vancouver, and Toronto, and then Chicago. So that's sort of the thumbnail sketch. 
<laughs> what, I just got asked, what was it like? Uh, what was John Candy like? Serious. And when he, um, when he put his mind to things, he was a very, very funny, funny, funny guy. Mm-hmm. But beneath it all, there was a deadly, earnest seriousness. And sometimes even, um, you know, kind of a, a, a volcanic anger. But, I mean, the guy was one of the sweetest, most intense people I know. And also, he was a really good teacher. I say this again and again in countless interviews since time, you know, since I began doing this. One thing that people don't know about John was how much of a damn funny teacher he was. So I was very lucky to be inculcated with his kind of knowledge uh, you know when he taught us workshops at Second City and um, I was very very fortunate and so that's what people I think don't know about him and also you know the fact is that he was a devoted family man and his, his children who are both alive and thriving today and are a testament to that fact yeah, I remember when John passed away. That that was a very um, sad day, and uh, always thought he was very, very funny. I actually had interviewed a couple of people that had worked with him. One one of them had said that uh, John Candy was always taking care of people. Like if you you were on the set, he he'd ask you uh, what your trailer was like, and you know, and he'd always make sure you had a good trailer. <laughs> Yeah, he was always one of those people that exactly would put himself second to other people. And he was always concerned about your well-being. And if he knew you and cared for you, he was really, really generous and friendly to a fault. Um, That's true. And, um, yeah, the day he died, I remember I was in London, Ontario, because my mother had been ill at the time. I think it was was September 5th, 19... Gosh, what was it, 1993 or four? Or Actually, uh, John Candy passed away early in uh, 1994. Actually, it was, uh, I think... It was Mar- it, I mean, March the 5th. Yeah, uh, March. Yeah. Mar- there about March or something, 1994, Four, yeah. as you said? Yeah. Because um, my mom was ill and I was in London and she had had a big operation that day. And I came down to the car, it was snowy, and I turned on the car and... They said, you know, he'll be best known for films like Splash. And, you know, I said, what do you mean best known? The CBC radio, and lo and behold, he died. Yeah. And in in Canada, you know, it was like a death in the family, wasn't it? Yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah. It was really, I mean, people took it, it was shocking. He was a 41, 40-year-old guy. He was horribly young, Mm -hmm. horribly sudden, and... um, you know, to those that knew him personally, uh, you know, I know we're going off a bit on John here, but to you know, those that knew him personally, it was almost to be expected because his father had died of a heart attack and he was very afraid of it. He was overweight and all that stuff. So, one of those sad tragedies. You know, my dad died very young. Well, not as young as John, but my dad died suddenly of a heart attack. So, it's something that, um, you know, I was not unfamiliar with. And it was kind of sad. Yeah. But he was a really, really good guy, a big-spirited guy. He, his daughter, Jennifer, is uh, she does this uh, interview show at Second City here in Los Angeles. And his son, Chris, I mean, he's a, you know looks just like him, my goodness. Yeah. And, the, and the, his wife, Rose, I mean, Rose really raised two beautiful people. Yeah. Another person that uh, passed away way too soon on us was uh, somebody else we're going to talk about, John Hughes. Like, I remember the day that uh, we lost him. Uh, um, yeah, that was shocking. And it was, to me, it was almost unbelievable, right? Because yeah. I hadn't seen him in a while. You know, it's one of those things that in the abstract you go, come on, this can't be true. Yeah. Yeah. How did you come to meet John Hughes? Because, I mean, you ended up being in three of his uh, key movies, you know, and, uh, well, yeah. Basically, it's kind of, you know, it was kismet for me. Um, also, John decided, given his sort of the course of his career and things, that he wanted to make his films in Chicago. 
which was fortuitous, obviously, for me. So at the time that he did that, um, the first thing I met him on was 16 Candles. And uh, the woman who cast it is named Jackie Birch, and she's still casting out there in the in the world. Uh, I just read for her recently and was rejected. <laughs> oh, <laughs> so, you know the beat, the beat goes on, but I mean you know, that's not not any fault of her own. She's always been a wonderful um, fan and and a great casting director and all this stuff. But the, the fact is that John came into town, the town being Chicago, to cast his movie, and he held a lot of. Uh, he had a lot of clout to do it in Chicago, and uh, I auditioned for the for the part of uh, Rudy Rizchek, and mm -hmm. uh, he responded positively. I remember the meeting was really good, and that was a great audition, and uh, I got the part. And, um, you know, one of the joys of that is that, you know, they, they cast a, a quote-unquote a local actor being a Chicago actor as opposed to an L.A. actor. And um, he went on to do The Breakfast Club, and uh, I was in New York at the time working at Second City, with Second City at the Village Gate, and I got wind of the fact that he was shooting the movie, and then I remember buying the trade papers, a variety paper in New York, and seeing that he started, you know, Breakfast Club lensing with John Hughes in Chicago, as, you know, lensing has begun primary cast in place and they had seen that Rick Moranis was doing the part of the janitor. Now just to fly back a little bit, John when I was shooting 16 Candles said, you know, I've got this script called The Breakfast Club and there's this part in it that I really want you to play and it's the janitor. So when I saw this in the in the variety in New York you know, months later or whatever I was really kind of um, you know saddened and shocked and I slammed the magazine shut and I went damn it I didn't get that part and and literally the next morning I got a call from my agent saying hey you know um, this breakfast club thing uh, the Rick Moranis has fallen out as she put it um, with John and uh, they'd like you to come in and replace him like wow okay how can we make that happen and so got an understudy flew to back to Chicago and started doing the movie and that was in, what, February of 1983, something like that. Um, it could be off on the year, but I think the film came out in 84. And the film came out so in 80, 80, 85. Was, it was 85 for Breakfast Club, 84 for uh, uh, 16 Candles. Yeah, so I, I could have been, I think I was in New York at that point in 84, so it was February 84, whatever. Yeah, I, it might be off by about a year, but... Um, so I was with the Second City, you know, we were doing a show at the Village Gate, and that's right, it was 1984, because the name of the show was called Orwell that ends well. And, um, yeah, so I came back to Chicago and shot The Breakfast Club, and having uh, replaced Rick Moranis, who uh, decidedly had a different take on the, the role. He apparently um, wanted to play the janitor as a Russian, with a thick Russian accent and all these sort of gold teeth and a big wad of keys between his legs that he played with provocatively. So, you know, it's about, they did a bunch of days of shooting. I don't know exactly how many. Um, and uh, he and John came to a parting of the ways. <laughs> you know, it's w interesting you say that because um, uh, 1984, Rick Moranis was in uh, Ghostbusters, and originally his part was supposed to be played by John Candy. And a, and a similar situation happened where John Candy wanted to play the part a, a specific way, and uh, Ivan Reitman just wasn't seeing it, I guess, and uh, and I guess Rick Moranis ended up getting the part. So I I, I don't <laughs> I don't get that, but uh, I I think you definitely served the part well. Well, you know, Ivan Reitman's got his own particular way of doing things. I'm not particularly. Uh... Uh, in the pocket with what he, you know, his vision all the time, but that's the way it, it was. I think that he probably made the wrong decision there. Although Rick Moranis is great in the movie, and I had really not known that. I had sort of heard that maybe that was the situation, but yeah, you know, casting is a process that that um, you know, obviously goes the way of the actor who's in the movie, and uh, you know, there are a lot of other people and players involved, other other performers, and. 
You know, sometimes it goes your way, and a lot of times it doesn't. You know, like, for the example, this year as an actor, I've, you know, I've been up for a lot of stuff, mm -hmm. and, um, you know, often it doesn't go your way. So. Out of the three John Hughes movies that you've done, uh, which is your favorite? I probably have a soft spot for um, 16 Candles, only insofar as it was the first. Um Nobody's, you know, it's funny, I've been asked that, and, um, I mean, obviously, Breakfast Club, I think, has the most impact, and I think is one of those films that, you know, has resonated in a way that, um, maybe I couldn't have, wouldn't have anticipated, mm -hmm. um, and uh, when I remember seeing it in a suburban theater in Chicago when it first came out, and going, wow, it was a huge theater, and the impact was pretty phenomenal. And it was a it was a really unmistakably, I mean, it was a powerful moment, I remember, in my life to see that. Um, so then I had sort of like, wow, this film's got some sort of cultural thing that, I, that I'm not really getting that, you know, is tapping into. Uh, but Sixteen Candles, to me, um, was exciting on a lot of levels because, it was, you know, kind of a, the whole thing was exciting. Working with Paul Dooley, and who, who I really love and admire and still know, and, uh, you know, who played my father in law. And, and um, you know, a lot of those older actors, to part of the experience I think that I really enjoy is, is meeting other actors and having the tradition passed on to you. Now I'm one of those older veteran actors, and I meet kids, and I work with them often that, you know, are sort of strangely in awe of me or what I've done or whatever films. And, and it's nice to sort of pass that tradition along, at least, you know, the ability to work with good performers. So, you know, on 16 Candles, uh, Carol Cook was in the movie, and mm -hmm. Max Showalter and Ernie Andrews, they're all the grandparents. Now, if you look at their film resumes, I mean, Carol Cook was in, you know, The Incredible Mr. Limpet, which is, Limpet, which is a film that I loved when I was, you know, eight years old. <laughs> and, um, you know, Ernie Andrews was in all these during Disney movies and, you know, The Manchurian Candidate and great films. And Max Showalter was in the movie Niagara with Joseph Cotton and Marilyn Monroe. Now, if you know your show films, you know that stuff. And, and so to me, you know, um, you know, sometimes I work with actors who don't even know who the hell I am and young actors who you know, either don't know, don't care, or both. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm one of those guys that, you know, um, even in the days before IMDB and the uh, Internet Movie Database and uh, – the internet, you know, would sort of research who I was working with. So when I worked with Brian Forbes, for example, when he directed me in The Naked Face with Roger Moore, Elliot Gould, and Rod Steiger, I mean, I knew that Brian Forbes had directed King Rat, which is a great movie with George Siegel, and Seance in a Wet Afternoon, and, and you know, had uh, acted in uh, A Shot in the Dark with Peter Sellers, you know. So it's, to me, it's important because the work is important, mm -hmm. and, um, and the, a cognizance of one's work, yeah, is not a prerequisite, but to a, a love and appreciate the craft and to, um, you know, honor them by knowing it and studying their work, I think, is, is kind of um, a prerequisite. <laughs> You know, my favorite of the Hughes films is Sixteen Candles. I love the way John Hughes just writes uh, a screenplay and you get lost in it because you can relate to what's going on. And he did some stuff in Sixteen Candles I thought was absolutely brilliant. Uh, one of, And I think the thing that stood out to me the most was the fact that Molly Ringwald, of course, is going to be celebrating her, her 16th birthday and uh, nobody nobody knows about it. And traditionally in a movie, they'd have people jump out and say surprise at the end of the movie. What I liked about here is that um, you have this gorgeous, beautiful uh, father-daughter moment when she's home, she's on the couch, and you got Paul Dooley come down, he turns the light on, he says, Sorry, dear we forgot your birthday and he and it was just a beautiful moment between a father and daughter and it was so real you know and uh i love the fact i think it's one of the best things that john hughes had written because it uh 
number one, you don't expect it. Number two, it was real. And uh, he was really good at stuff like that. Yeah, he was. He um, he had a gift for putting moments like that together and, and, and having them work. You know, and there are, there are moments like that in a lot of his movies, you know. Yeah. Not everyone, but, you know, Home Alone definitely has it. Planes, Trains, and Automobiles, Uncle Buck, Breakfast Club have those moments. Yeah. Um, you know, and sometimes they don't work. You know, sometimes they can be treacly and off, but sometimes they can be, you know, powerful. I think that Planes, Trains, and Automobiles is one of my favorite John Hughes movies. Oh, yes. Um, you know, and I'm not involved in it, obviously, but it's it's an Uncle Buck. And both of those, because I love John Candy. Yes. Uh, well, you know, he was John was a really good filmmaker. You know, the the thing about great filmmakers, you know, from John Hughes to Guillermo del Toro, who I just, you know, I'm in a movie, The Shape of Water, that he just uh, had come out, is that they are visionaries, right? Mm -hmm. And they 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 understand the type of thing they want to see, and they have it in their mind's eye, and their mind's eye puts it up on the screen, and and that process is exacting. Depending on the filmmaker, whether it's Hitchcock or Guillermo del Toro or John Hughes or Robert Altman, they manage to get up there in their sort of inimitable fashion. So. Well, I've done one interview from uh, Sixteen Candles. I had Leanne uh, Curtis on back in May, and she was a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. Yeah, she she's a blast. And um, I was in touch with Havilah Morris. Um, I wasn't able to get her. Uh, maybe eventually. I had. She did send me a beautiful autograph picture, though, which I thought was really sweet. And uh, that's another thing too. In Sixteen Candles, I really appreciated because Havilah Morris played the what it was, would be the typical uh, um, uh, snooty uh, opposite to Molly Ringwald and. I love the fact that by the end of the movie, we're allowed to like her, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And, of course, <laughs> you have this very funny character you play where you say, like, it's funny because in The Breakfast Club, you say the right things. But the year before in 16 Cal, you're saying all the wrong things. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, he's, um, he's, a, he's a bit of a lout and, um, you know, it's questionable whether that marriage really ever worked out. <laughs> you know, I've often thought that uh, they should have done the 16 Candles divorce version. <laughs> <laughs> or at least 32 Candles or whatever it is. But I, I think that um, there's a lot of political incorrectness in 16 Candles. You know, Long Duck Dong is looked upon now by a lot of Asian people as being a little bit squeamish. But, um, you know, I think that there's a lot of... Uh, there's a lot of good-natured fun in it, and John, John likes to play with archetypes and then sort of smash them. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, I think his the character that I think is to me the most lovingly done character is, of course, the Anthony Michael Hall character. Oh, I liked him in it. Yes. Yeah, because he's really kind of um, there's something really sweet about his kind of the arc and journey of his character, right? Yep. Uh, he's, because he's, um, and also I think when I, I remember doing the movie, and I had never seen an adult and a kid so kind of intertwined intellectually, and if that's kind of, you know, John could, you know, Michael would finish John's sentences and vice versa, so they were, they were in each other's head at that point. Okay. John was really, he was, Michael Hall was really John's alter ego. Okay. And, was, and, and there was a very interesting, you know, dynamic, interesting uh, dynamic to see. You know? I love that scene where Anthony Michael Hall gets in that uh, car in the, the uh, shop uh, section of the school there with Molly Ringwald. And it was just, again, another great moment where... <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's the moment, actually, that I'm... In my mind's eyes, I'm speaking to them about the movie. That scene sort of is the one that sits out for me. Yeah. Because there's, um, yeah, there's a real, there's a real honesty, and that's a very good scene to circle in, sort of say, where all the elements come together. Yeah. Because character and, 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 you know, it, and story sort of meld at that moment. But, um, 
Yeah, you know, and John, again, John was sadly missed. I don't think that he really, uh, you know, I didn't see him after a while in Hollywood. He went off and did his things and became, you know, ultimately successful and then went on to do what I think are like, like Dennis the Menace and things like that and then dropped out. Yeah. Um, uh, dropped out for some inexplicable reasons. I've read and heard and even expounded upon, you know, what could have happened. But at the end of the day, um, he left Hollywood. I think coming from writing and advertising, particularly writing, like for the Lampoon and being sort of an auteur, a singular author type, John really hated the the um, I wouldn't say the collaborative aspect because he knew you have to collaborate, but it was the dictatorial aspect of the film business. The way the producers and the money people could, you know, basically mess with his glory. Oh, I hear you. And, yeah. and, and ironically what happens in these situations, and the story is often told and is, is said, is that the more successful you get, the more they mess with you, right? Mm-hmm. Because the more they sort of want to get in on that sort of... Uh, special sauce and that's when the special sauce can get messed up so it's kind of a it's kind of an odd tale isn't it yes how much fun was blanche baker who of course had the, had the highlight scene at the wedding <laughs> blanche is great you know real real trooper i mean not easy to do that scene no and not easy to play that sort of uh, histrionic sort of craziness but she's great <laughs> Her mother was a great Carol Baker, who was a wonderful, beautiful yes. actress. Yes. Um, Blanche has now got many, many children. is an artist living in New York, and is a quite an accomplished artist. Um, yeah. But you know, very funny, and 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 uh, also, you know, uh, one thing that people don't realize is it's tough to be good looking and funny. You know, there you can count the number of good looking, funny women on one hand. Yeah. Carol Lombard to, uh, you know. To Melissa McCarthy, and even Melissa McCarthy's not, you know, I mean, she's more character but I mean, really classically good-looking and funny, funny is a hard combo. Yes, yes. And, uh, you know, Shelley Long, maybe, and, you know, people like that, so. Yeah. And then, of course, you but, know. But, and Molly, Molly was a, a good kind of foil for John. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, he worked with her in, uh, three movies and uh of course uh she was one of these um she wasn't like the the big bombshell you know but she was really really attractive without uh what's the word I'm looking looking for um I wouldn't say plain jane but she was I I thought she was very attractive loved the red hair but she wasn't the uh the classic uh cheerleader type you know and she was one that uh, you didn't always notice, but yet, yet uh, by the end of the film, of course, it's the one that My, uh, Michael Shuffling is aiming after. You get what I'm talking about there? Yeah, no, there's a sweetness and a vulnerability to her. And there's obviously a very, you know, very cute sexiness to her. I mm -hmm. think. It's not, as you would say, classically, you know, like Anne Hathaway would be more the waspy girl. You know, that, that sort of, yes, yeah, Molly's got a really good quality to her. And when utilized correctly and, and properly, and John was really, you know, he really knew how to write for her. Yeah, and, uh, you know, you, of course, as I said, six, I, I, I've yet to see 16 Candles on a theater screen. I, I'm hoping to get the chance to do that sometime because I, I love 16 Candles. But I, I have seen The Breakfast Club uh, three, I think three times right now, uh, twice at a midnight screening. So I go tell you, it was packed. That movie is very popular here. And, of, of course, uh, you play the janitor, and I love the fact that Judd Nelson's character tries to tries to downplay you, like, how does one become a janitor, you know? And I love how you one-upped him by saying, you know, I see all your notes. I go through your lockers. I am the eyes and the ears of this place. And then you the, love that final, final blow where you say, by the way, that clock's 20 minutes fast. 
Yeah, the thing is that um, the um, the whole point of my character in that moment, at least from my point of view, and maybe why it works and why people react to it, is that I was not playing it for laughs. Um, you know, I was playing the guy straight mm -hmm. and, you know, ironically. And But the thing is that um, there's a status game, as I would say, something we would play a lot in improvisation in Second City, but, you know, where you improvise sort of status elements. Speak about it, it's very dry, but, you know, I, I could say, oh, I'm... Uh, I love Queen Elizabeth, and you could say, "Oh yeah, I, I met her. For, I had her for. I met. I, I had her. I met her for lunch yesterday." And it's like, "Oh my goodness, you know Queen Elizabeth." So all of a sudden, you've raised your status. I've lowered mine. Mm -hmm. And you know, so people do that in real life. That's kind of a silly explanation of it. But when in that scene, for example, he's trying to put me down, and instead, what I do is I sort of ra I lower his status and raise mine. By basically saying, hey, you know, I know what you're about, and don't mess with me, sort of thing. So it's it's a seesaw thing where I'm down at the beginning, and then I sort of tip turn the scales. And it's about um, cleverness. There's a sort of a... There, there, in John's movies, there are, um, you know, people connect or don't connect on certain levels. And... And, like, a lot of Molly's character sometimes is about trying not to connect, particularly with Vendor. Um, yeah. And, uh, you know, the teacher is trying to connect. Um, the whole film is about connection or lack thereof with their parents and why they're disconnected there on a Saturday morning. And there's a moment there, strangely, where Bender and I connect and where I basically, you know, you know knock him a bit. And... Um, Anyway, um, I'm, I'm overly analyzing it, but that's, you know, that's what we do. <laughs> and I love that sequence uh, between you and uh, Paul Gleason, too, where, again, he's the big authority figure, but, uh, again, you, you know what's going on, you know? It's like um, you're the one that's got the janitor, but yet you're the one that's kind of like... It's almost like you're uh, Clark Clark Kent, but you're really Superman, you know? Well, the, the cleverness of John's writing is that basically what he did was he transformed the character of the janitor in that sort of pre that situation. And really, it's just a bed that I lay in very lightly. But it's what he did was he created the fact that the guy is omniscient. He's like the lockers and the electricity and the lights in the school. He's there. He's always there. And he's kind of one of these things that goes unnoticed. There's a wonderful movie by uh, David Mamet that, that uh, Steve Martin is in called The Spanish Prisoner. Have you ever seen it? Oh, that? yes, I have. Yeah, Steve Martin doing a dramatic great, role. There's this great line at the end where, Dave, uh, Steve Mar uh, where David Mamet has written, he goes, nobody notices a Japanese tourist. Um, you know, and they're, they're all, the, all the FBI agents on the, on the boat at the end that capture this. And, and it's a great line because nobody notices a Japanese tourist. That's true because they're they're so ubiquitous that nobody would suspect them or whatever. And in the, in the same way, John sort of said, "Well, nobody would notice a janitor because janitors are in the school. They're sort of creeping around like you know, unnoticed." But but then you go, "Well, wait a minute. Who is that? And what is that? And what do they represent?" So, um, and then John also very cleverly in the Breakfast Club, whether you got it or not, I'm sure you might have is that he shows a picture of me as a student at the school at the beginning. Okay, yeah. So the janitor, in my case, was probably, you know, one of these hotshot football guys. So I played it like, you know, I really, you know, my best days were there. So part of Carl's problem is that he can't leave there emotionally. What was it like to work with Paul Gleason? Oh, um, to be honest, we didn't get along initially. Um, and Paul was a bit rough and tumble. He's passed away, and I went to his funeral, and I cared for him and respected him very much. Um, uh, and he would agree with me that, you know, we sort of had different modes of working. He's a um, different sort of actor than I am. And so we did, did a lot of time on the phone talking about stuff, 
in the time we were shooting, and he was very meticulous in his note taking. Uh, I, on the other hand, um, not that I'm not meticulous, but I also do a, a particularly at that time was doing a lot of improvising in and around the character, and sort of. Uh, and, and John would ask me to, for example, uh, you know, um, we do. X number of takes, probably six to eight takes. John had what we would call, a, in the days of f shooting film, a high shooting ratio. So he'd shoot maybe 15, 18, 20 takes to one being used. Now, compared to Stanley Kubrick, apparently he shot 75 takes, but and other filmmakers. But, you know, he worked under the theory, which I believe is once you're in the middle of the process, the least expensive element you have is film, really. So when you're shooting something, let's shoot it again, shoot it again. So there was an element of perfectionism, sometimes the overshot. But we'd shoot something like a bunch of takes on something and get it as written. And then John would have the uh, trust in me and, and the knowledge, because of this is why he hired me and he knows my background and knew what I was capable of, both comedically and, and improvisationally, to ask me to improvise, which I did. So, you know, lines like when I was a kid I wanted to be John Lennon was a line I improvised, blah, blah, blah. There's a lot in the movie that um, is mine. When I say mine, it's like came out of my mouth after discussions with John, lines that I might have morphed with him, we might have discussed, you know, um, any which way. Uh, and there was a lot of that. What happened is that when you shoot a sequence, you shoot a master take, um, and then John would shoot coverage. You shoot coverage on Paul, and then over my shoulder, let's say, and coverage on me. So in the situation we were in, John didn't like to really lean on the master that much. He'd maybe shoot a rough master that they'd use occasionally, like on a two-shot, but he usually came in for the coverage. He went in on Paul's coverage first, and then he came around on me, and he asked me to do a lot of improvising. And then Paul got pissed off and said, well, if he's going to say that and do that, I didn't react to him doing that you need to come back around on me and john said no we've got it and therein lay a conflict because paul thought he was being shortchanged um because he thought i was getting all this different stuff on my takes that he wasn't given an ability to react to uh, it was also a little bit of his wanting to get more you know time which is a little bit of a trick of his if you see the movie and you see the spot where I'm in the basement, and he goes, Carl, you know, I'm going through these files and blah, blah, blah. And, well, you know, what do you want? And I go, 50 bucks. <laughs> if you see that shot, that was, John had told me before that take, because we'd done several takes before, where I was actually waiting for a cue line, and, and Paul was just really stalling, really just, like, you know, uh, l making his line go longer and there was this kind of live tv sort of stalling technique he was using like come on get to but john after a couple of takes said to me just cut him off and say 50 bucks well i did and that's the take that's in the movie and you see paul's reaction is one of total surprise <laughs> on his face and the second they yelled cut he started really getting off on me i mean going off on me and and sort of bearing in poked his finger in my chest and we had a few words and it got a little bit contentious, but, you know, he was a fighter, Paul. He comes from that school of the Robert Duvall, and he was his buddy, and, you know, there's an element of real edginess to him. So, and, you know, he understood his humor. It's true, he's funny, but he wasn't what I would call a funny ha-ha guy. No. You know? Did you see, just by any chance, uh, Not Another Teen movie? Apparently, I, I, I didn't, but um, I've never said this out loud, but apparently John really got pissed off at him for doing that. Oh, really? I, oh, yeah. I did not know he that. Really pissed off. Well, I don't, think, uh, I don't think a lot of people know that. Matter of fact, you know, this might be a scoop. Oh, but, man. Um, but, oh, you know, there's nobody to corroborate that now because they're both gone. Well, Paul Gleason, and, again, playing the teacher, and there's the people in the... I, I thought it was a funny... It wasn't a great movie, but it, it, that scene, I thought, was pretty funny. It was kind of cool to see Paul Gleason returning to uh, 
that kind of thing again. And you know, um, yeah. Well, apparently it didn't go down well in John Hughes' world. Yeah, I did not know that. No. Well, I haven't seen the movie, and um, you know, I'm not privy to what happened. So. Oh, you could probably be on YouTube. I know you can find the clip. I know that. I'm not interested. Yeah, you and know, of course, honestly, honestly, you know, um, I met Chick Corea, the piano player, and he doesn't listen to his own own albums because he's just too busy recording and writing new stuff. Yeah. And I said, well, I, and I love his albums. I said, I listen to them again and again. And he goes, well, I don't have time to do that. And sometimes it's just for me, you know, there are things that. I just don't want to watch bad movies. I don't want to be at the end of my life and say, Jesus, I wasted two and a half hours watching not another teen movie. <laughs> um, and of course, I'm serious. Yeah. I'm damn serious. I'm I'll, serious. I, I agree. I, I would rather have spent the two and a half hours talking to you. But <laughs> that's just me. That's just me. And mind uh, you, I, I, you know, I like watching movies and a lot of bad ones at that, but that, that one I'll, I'll skip. Uh, Pitch Perfect uh, celebrated uh, the Breakfast Club, though. I'm not sure if you're aware of that, though. I am. Uh, I heard of that, and I've also heard there. You know, there are a lot of shows that have done homage to it. You know, so that's great. Yeah. Well, this was a and, very uh, positive homage because one of the characters wanted to write scores for movies, and one of the movies he championed was The Breakfast Club. You know, with mm. that end theme song and the raising of the fist. You know, by Judd Nelson. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know they're they're iconic, and um, I'm I'm proud to be part of them. I'm uh, I'm sad that John's gone. I am also uh, I also really do believe that the the one thing that works the, with with good filmmakers to this very moment is the voice that they have, right? Yeah. And and John had a real voice, and the thing that I think without being too overly analytical about John's work, is that he did not condescend to his audience. You know, a lot of movies talk down to people. Oh, yes. And when, you know, and I tell this story often, but when I was a kid, I'd go to the movies with my dad, and, um, you know, the lights would come up at the end of the film, and he'd turn to me and go, what do they think we are, stupid? And, I, and then years later, I'd be in Hollywood, and... Uh, working with a producer, and I'll be writing something, going, don't use that word, because the audience is stupid. <sighs> when, ah, that's why. They do think we're, you're stupid, Dad. You know? And um, what happens, you know, and one of the things, of the many, many things I learned at Second City is that the audience is as smart as, if not smarter than you are. At least the audience that I'm shooting for. I'm not looking for dumb audiences. No. But I'm not interested in dumb product. And I hate it when somebody talks down to me. I try the same here, yeah. yeah. You know, when I was a kid and somebody said a word in a movie I didn't get, I looked it up. And nowadays it seems like, you know, um, people avoid making people think. And that's kind of a, that's kind of an offshoot of sort of the dumbing down whole aspect of things. But, you know, that's, that's a different sociological discussion. <laughs> Well, you were also in Weird Science, uh, the third one, uh, John Hughes film you was in, and uh, that was a very interesting movie, too. Do uh, uh, you, you want to tell us about your experience on that film? Yeah. Um, it was actually when uh, the, the thing that I remember most about that film is shooting here in Los Angeles, which is, I live in Los Angeles now, and was it was the first film I'd really done on a studio soundstage filled with, you know, hundreds of extras, and it was a sequence where they come in the bar and everybody goes silent, yep. you know, and it's a big room of people. And, uh, you know, I think it was the beginning of the Hollywoodization of John Hughes, that's for sure, you know. I, the other two movies I'd done, I don't think I shot any of Weird Science in Chicago, but both Breakfast Club and Sixteen Candles I'd done whole cloth in Chicago. So the weird science uh, was chapter three. <coughs> and actually, I was in um, Ferris Bueller, too, but I was cut out of it. So I did four John Hughes movies. I love Ferris um, Bueller. Yeah. And uh, I was the cab driver that took him around downtown, but they cut me out of that sequence. And I don't know. Uh, there was a source of um, a little bit of, I don't know. It was the last thing I did for John. So um it didn't. I don't know whether it didn't end well or just it, it didn't end in a way that I would have hoped it would. So, 
And of course, your three films uh, with him, uh, of course, Anthony Michael Hall in all three. <laughs> and, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And, you had, um, yeah. and uh, Anthony's still out there in the world. He and I, I actually did an episode of The Dead Zone with him, too, many years later. Mm-hmm. You had so, some uh, in- interesting people in Weird Science. Of course, Kelly LeBrock, everybody remembers her, and this is the woman that was created by these two adolescents. And well, yeah, and, and her claim to fame, in addition to being Kelly LeBrock, was that at the time she was in a relationship with a man named Victor Dre. And Victor Dre now is uh, got a bunch of places in LA, in uh, Vegas, Dre's, and he's in big with... Um, Trump, I think, Trump hotels and that stuff. He's very, you know, but, and in addition to that, Bill Pullman was in uh, Weird Science, you know, and I knew Bill and uh, very sad to have lost him earlier this year. Bill Paxton. Bill Paxton. Bill sorry, Paxton. Paxton. <laughs> I worked with Bill Pullman. I'm, yeah, I worked with Bill Pullman too. I, I misspoke. Yeah. Bill Paxton. Yeah. Thank God, Bill Pullman's still around. Sorry, Bill <laughs> And of course, yeah, you had Bill pa- two. Bill Paxton, who is really good friends with Rick Rossovich, who I yeah. worked with in Rock Band. And, you know, so Paxton was so great in uh, Weird Science, as in everything he did. I mean, it's yes. wonderful. And in, in, uh, I just loved him in, in um, the, the show about the, uh, the Mormons. Yep. And of course, you had two be- other beautiful ladies in there too, Suzanne Snyder and Judy Aronson, and I'm familiar with them and like both of them in it as well. Well, Judy's a, a, a friend as well as a Facebook friend, and I, I yeah, I know Judy quite well. Yeah, you know, the, the thing is that um, John uh, Hughes had good taste, and he hired good people, you know, and we were fortunate to be in his movies. I have a Judy right. story with uh, Judy. I, she was in Friday the 13th, the final chapter. And I've been trying for a couple of years to get her on my show. And Ted White, I interviewed, who played Jason in that movie. And um, I had a great interview with Ted. And, and um, Ted, you you, you, you got to connect with Judy Aronson. And off offline, after we were done recording the interview, he gave me her phone number. But I didn't gave me hers and one other Jason actor, and uh, I never called either one because I didn't want to creep anybody out. But I messaged her a couple times and she's never gotten back to me, even though I I mentioned the Ted White endorsement. But uh, anyway, I'm gonna keep trying with her. But it's it was interesting seeing her uh, after the Friday the Thirteenth, the final chapter, seeing her in Weird Science, seeing her go from a horror film victim to playing the in the uh, John Hughes film. So. Well, you know, um, uh, people do what they do. I mean, it's it's a good thing. It's a good thing that she's working. Now, um, apart from uh, John Hughes, you've uh, of course you mentioned Roxanne, and of course uh, one of those pivotal uh, Steve Martin roles, you know, where he's got the long nose, and of course Daryl Hannah, he's trying to ends up falling in love with her even though he's trying to help somebody else get set up with her and i know that you love rose uh, Ro- excuse me, roseanne roxanne because i know i've seen some interviews with you um you want to talk about your experience on that film and working with steve martin yeah i mean you know steve martin is one of the sweetest um people i've worked with he's a very very low-key um a guy he's very to himself um he's you know, uh, intense, perhaps a bit strange and weird to some, and uh, um, uh, very, very, very funny. Yeah. But he also is one of these guys that doesn't, um, you know, play Steve Martin in public, you know? He's yeah, I've heard that. Of, he's kind of low-key. Um, that said, the experience on the movie was wonderful. There are very, very few times in my career when the experience on the film is as good as the movie itself. Sometimes you can have a great experience and the movie can be really sour, bad. And sometimes you can have a really bad experience and the movie can be very good. And sometimes you can, and as in Roxanne, you can have a fabulous experience and the movie can be fabulous. And that was the case in that. I, uh, Fred Skepsi, the director, the Australian director, uh, made a really 
funny film. Um, we were invited to watch dailies every night in those days when, again, shot on movies. So we'd see them a couple of days later. We were shooting in Nelson, British Columbia. So they rented this big movie theater, and we'd all watch every night at 7 o'clock. We'd all get together and watch them and see what everybody was shooting. And, and it was a really big communal thing. You had Fred Willard and Rick Scheidner and, uh, you know, uh, 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 Kevin Nealon and and uh, Shelley Duvall and uh, you know Max Alexander and and Steve Middleman and all the guys who were the firemen. Everybody would be in the movie theater and and uh, we'd be watching the sort of the very fine, almost mime-like quality of Steve's work. And we were really getting a sense of the kind of the Chaplin-esque aspect to his his character. And you know, obviously, this is based on a story by a. Is Cyrano de Bergerac is, is uh, Edmund de Rostand. It's a very famous um, story that Steve adapted, and the whole thing had a kind of a magical quality to it. Yes, um, shooting and just the experience itself was basked in that. I was fortunate enough to, um, you know, to be cast in it and to be treated very, very well by all concerned. Uh, Steve and Dan Melnick, the producer, and Fred Skepsi, and uh, there are lots of wonderful memories from it. One of the more unusual experiences, and I strangely enough had to relay this the other night to, um, I saw Jackson Brown the other night in the, in, the, in the gas station. I was filling my car up here in L.A., and as one would have it in California, you just run into people, you know, and there's at 11 o'clock at night is Jackson Brown filling up his car. It ended up, he said, this is my son's car. I said, Jackson, John Kapalos. Uh, I pronounce it Kapalos, but you said, said Kapellas, but we'll... Oh, Kapalos? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. It's all right. My brother says Kapellas. There are two different ways, of, or Kapellos, or whatever. Okay. There are two different ways of pronouncing it, so that's that's uh, that's just a minor point of interest about me. Okay. But anyway, Jackson Brown is there, and I said... Remember the very first day of Roxanne? He goes, what? Oh, yeah. I said, and then I relayed the story that I'm about to tell you. Is that I was the first shot, first day in Roxanne, the very first shot of the uh, first day of the movie that they were shooting on downtown Nelson, British Columbia, with a thousand people of the city just sort of behind these barricades. And it's me and Daryl Hannah, uh, and I'm in this shop called All Things Dead. And... Uh, I sweat when I look at a light bulb. I, you know, I'm a sweater. Mm -hmm. Here it is, probably 100 degrees Fahrenheit uh, in Nelson, B.C. I forget what the centigrade would be on that. But <laughs> it was really, really, really hot and very humid. The July day, maybe late June or something. And I'm in a full-length, 112, 115-pound beaver-length coat. <laughs> And I'm the first shot, first day, and I am sweating to beat the band. I am just one puddle of water. And Jackson Brown was dating Daryl Hannah, and he was hanging out. So he would go down to the Dairy Queen. The production gave him money. <laughs> <laughs> and he just came back with, like, slushies for me all the time. Oh. I was just drinking slushies, which probably hyperventilated me and made me sweat even more. But uh, that that's a story I reminded him of, and that's kind of one of my sweeter little memories of you know, you remember small stuff about stuff. Yes. Know? I thought that was a cool thing that he'd do that, though. <laughs> yeah, so, you know, Jackson Brown bought me, brought me slushies. <laughs> I, I thought that's pretty that's pretty freaking cool. And uh, he had to giggle about that as he drove off in the night in his son's car. You know, I noticed another film you were in was Nothing in Common for Gary Marshall mm -hmm. with Tom Hanks. And, of course, it was the last movie, I think, that Jackie Gleason was in. That's right. It was his last film, and, and he, he, uh, it was the beginning. Thanks, uh, you know, amazing career. So, what were your memories of Jackie Gleason? Well, I remember him. First of all, he was very old, and he would shuffle in very slowly to work in the morning, uh, and he'd come in and sort of be looking down. His uh, his gait was kind of um, mitigated by by age, and he was. Uh, kind of tentative. So as I said, he was kind of shuffling in. He'd come in with his wife on one hand, uh, and his manager would sit with him the whole day. Yeah. And he'd look around as he arrived on the set, and he'd go, Gentlemen, let's go to Wake. 
and he'd sit himself down in his chair, and his manager would ta- pass him a, a sort of a plastic tumbler that had something in it. I don't know what it was. And he would sit there and nurse it all day with his wife there, and he'd get up and do his lines and do his work. Um, this was in the ad, ad agency where he comes to visit uh, uh, Tom Hanks. We shot there for a couple of days. He was with us. And he depended on one of my line cues at one point to, to enter the scene. That was exciting. That was the closest I got to acting with him. Um, but um, because he's looking for his son in that sequence, Tom. Yeah. And then at the end of the day, uh, they'd whisper in his ear and say, Mr. Mr. Uh, Gleason, that's a wrap. And he'd, he'd pass the tumbler to his manager. He'd get up with the help of his wife from his chair. He'd look up and go, ladies and gentlemen, it's been a pleasure. And then he'd sort of shuffle off. <laughs> <laughs> Pardon me, and everybody was enamored with him. Uh, one of my co uh, colleagues and co Second City people, Mike Haggerty, who uh, was in the film with me, uh, had bought his uh, biography, his book, and uh, asked him to sign it. And it was almost as if the Pope had uh, blessed him. Um, he was so excited. And uh, there was a lot of that sort of homage to him. I mean, Tom was great with him. And of course, Gary Marshall was really, really sweet with him. Yep. And, uh, you know, to Gary Marshall, you know, who had created Happy Days and Laverne and Shirley, you know, this guy was the, you know, the Honeymooners was one of his idols, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so everybody was kind of in awe of him. Uh, and, um, you know, I think Nothing in Common is a really great movie. And I think it's one of Gary Marshall's better movies. And, uh, again, it's a movie where I improvise a lot. There's this whole sequence with Tom at the end where he's freaking about his father, freaking out about his father being ill, and I sort of calm him down. It's a really good movie. Mm-hmm. And it's also a really lovely, um, again, representation of Chicago. Chicago is a nice sort of character in the film as well. And, of course, Eva Marie Saint is in this as well, you know, from... Uh, My pers- God, yes. Yeah. Eva Marie Saint, you know who is, you know, she is a saint. She's, she's, you know, one of the classiest, most exciting performers I've ever been around. Mm-hmm. I told her so, I think, blatheringly one point, and she probably thought I was crazy. Um, but, you know, you, you see her in, in uh, you know, on the waterfront, and, you know, you watch those TCM, Turner Classic Movie interviews with her. She's, you know to be admired and regarded I think that she's a, a real treasure yeah North and by she, Northwest she, played this year at the, up the theater too uh, for the classic God film yes. yeah God yes you know again a movie that you e- e- features Chicago prominently particularly in the sequence at the uh, the Ambassador East but you know it's inside baseball stuff but that's the hotel where James Stewart is where she meets him in Chicago and then you mean Cary Grant yeah. Yeah, uh, James Stewart. Um, so yeah, Cary Grant. What am I thinking? I'm getting James Stewart and Cary Grant. Well, they were both in four Hitchcock movies. So. You know why? Because Rear Window's been on TV, so I've sort of got Jimmy Stewart in my mind. I love Rear Window. With Grace Kelly, right? So I love yeah. Grace Kelly. Yeah, well, how can you not? So, But, uh, but um, yeah, where Cary Grant's at the Ambassador, and he's he's always got that same blue suit on that never seems to get dirty. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Yeah, that's where they send it out to get cleaned. I think uh, at that point. Yeah. But and and they discover that what's his name is a phony. Uh, is just a, a, a you know, uh, Roger whatever it is. The, the Roger. Name that he's been yeah. Yep. But, yeah. Um. You know, and who else is in the film? Dan Castellaneta. You know, my who's the voice of Homer Simpson, who was with me in Second City. He's in the movie. There are a lot of Second City people in in Nothing in Common. Mm-hmm. And. Uh, and Gary Marshall, you know, who uh, just, you know, left, the, left uh, shuffled off the mortal coil, was really, really uh, cool to work with. I mean, that was probably more than weird science, what I feel is my very first doing a real movie in Los Angeles was when I worked on Nothing in Common. Wow. I mean, Weird Science was an ex- one or two day experience, but nothing in common. I mean, I did a lot of work on that movie. Yep. So. And uh, I've been interviewed for it in New York. I remember meeting on it, at, and then we had uh, we had just wrapped Roxanne. No, no, I had wrapped Roxanne. I don't know. I had 
No, no, no. I would just have the Breakfast Club. So it was it was before Roxanne. So. Yeah. You were also in a movie that called called The Boost, where you get to work, of course, with uh, James Wood and and Sean Young. And boy, you get yeah. you get nailed awfully hard by <laughs> yeah, by James Wood. <laughs> They're in the when hospital. He me? Yeah, in the hospital. Yeah, you know, it's it's a uh, Harold Becker is the director. Mm-hmm. Um, it's um, yeah, Stephen Hill is in it too, right? Um, Stephen Hill, who was the original guy in Mission Impossible, was replaced by Peter Graves. Because Stephen Hill was an Orthodox Jew and and couldn't do the working hours that they required. Oh. Uh, in the original Mission Impossible TV series, he did the first two seasons. Okay. Um, and Stephen Hill was in uh, the Boost too. Mm. He plays the boss. Um, uh, you know the the movie is uneven, um, and that's being kind. Harold Becker was a director, as I said, a Vision Quest and. Uh, I think uh, what's the movie with um, oh with uh, no I'm forgetting it now it's Ellen Barkin and uh, Al Pacino um, oh uh, is it Sea of Love yeah Sea of Love okay yeah exactly very good and um, you know uh, Jimmy Woods is an intense dude uh, Sean Young was at the peak of her, you know, uh, 12 and a half seconds of fame and um, wasn't handling it particularly well. No. And they had a torrid affair during the film, and, you know, the film shut down at the end because Woods was, you know, breaking up with her, and his, it was just this, it was kind of like being in a horrible high school drama. Um I'm being honest with you. I mean, it was it, it was fun. It was great to do the part, and uh, I, you know, the film works on certain levels. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, Woods has become I don't know whether you've seen in the news recently the sort of right wing guy. Okay. And who's become uh, quite uh, enamored with uh, the current uh, president of this country. Um, and. Uh, as a result, I don't know. I mean, he there's a there's an element of craziness in his performance and his performances, and uh, the the movie, you know, it's about cocaine, and I think my character, uh, you know, it's a gritty film, and I'm actually kind of proud of it. There's another film that I did shortly thereafter that I think has a lot more gravitas and holds a lot more, uh, sort of works a lot more, and is sort of stood up to the test of time better, which is Internal Affairs. Over with your gear, yeah. Yeah, I think that movie is uh, superior. Okay. Um, in a lot of ways, uh, but the boost, you know, um, it has its moments, and uh, it it was a film that strove for more. There were great; it had great elements in it. Like I think Daryl Ponixon, who wrote the screenplay, and and uh, the producers were really good. Um, I think I think the director Harold Becker uh, had his moments. I just think that the movie is kind of lopsided. There are moments when it works and then it doesn't. Did you, did you like working with Richard Gere? I did. Yeah? I did. It was one of those things where, to be honest, I really didn't think much about working with him until I met him. Okay. You know, people were going, oh, he's this or he's that. And this was at the height of this horrible gerbil thing that was going on around him. Okay. I don't know whether you'd heard about that. Mm, not sure. I don't... There was a horrible rumor going around that he, you know... It's just horrible rumor about him. You can look it up on the internet. People. Can I, I don't follow the tabloids a whole lot because I find a lot well, of it sensationalizes a bunch of junk, you know. And yeah, but yeah, this was kind of a this was kind of a weird thing that happened to him. That somebody a horrible rumor that it started in Hollywood, and I'm not going to grace it with anything on your 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 show. Your that's podcast. okay. That's okay. You know, because I don't want to. No. But it, it 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 was it was horrible, and apparently years later. It was somebody claimed responsibility for the story, some other Hollywood jerk who I won't mention because I don't want to give him a moment. No. But Richard Gere was one of these gentlemen. He's a really, really low-key guy. He's not like Daniel Day-Lewis in that, you know, you know he's doing a part, he's Lincoln, or he's this and that. His type of acting is he plays very close to who he is. Yeah. So he just plays. But in Richard, in, in Rich, he was in, in internal affairs. 
you know, and he has a screen persona, right? He's got a sort of cool, sexy guy mm-hmm. who, you know, in, in, in internal affairs, he was really playing against type because he was playing a real, real bad person. He was a sexually uh, malevolent. He was an abusive guy. He was a serial sort of uh, a misogynist. You know, um, he was a murderer. He's a bad guy on a lot of levels. Mm-hmm. And, and the movie doesn't pull any punches. And you watch him sort of play his, uh, do his sort of rackets throughout the whole thing, work who he is. And uh, the film is really a film noir. It's a very dark movie. Um, Michael Figgis and John Alonzo, who, by the way, was the same cinematographer on Nothing in Common. Okay. Great John Alonzo. Um, look him up. He, he was a cinematographer in Internal Affairs. And you know, I think he worked with Peckinpah, you know, great, great d- director of photography, DP. And, um, you know, Mike Figgis, I wish, I don't, you know, he made Leaving Las Vegas afterwards, which is a huge, huge hit for him. And he sort of has gone away as a filmmaker. Uh, but, man, there's a sequence where he's, Richard Gere is asking me, uh, you know, uh, I'm asking him to kill my parents, and he's kind of feeling my wife up under the table. It's kind of one of the most weird experiences I've ever had on and off screen. It was great. Uh, and it was a great professional experience. In other words, it's one of those moments where, um, to me, uh, I watch it and I go, wow, that's, that's, that's when it works, you know? And, and it's, you, can, I, you can pull the wool over everybody's eyes, but sometimes it's hard to pull over my eyes. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Well, you got uh, some uh, other... And huh? I'm a pretty good audience member for the most part, you know? Yeah. I was going to say there's a, some other films that I have listed here from your IMDb that some of which I haven't heard of, but I definitely, what reading up on I'm interested in, but I did notice that uh, you're uncredited for Tootsie and Legally Blonde. Now, yeah, yeah and Tootsie, a great, great movie. Legally Blonde, uh, very entertaining as well. Uh, any memories of those? Yeah, definitely. Um, Tootsie, I'm uncredited because, uh, um, you know, I, I got the, it was very early in my career, I got flown to New York. I was asked to do the movie, Tony Howard and, Lynn Stallmaster casting were really nuts over me. Uh, I had a really negative reaction from uh, Dustin Hoffman and Bill Murray. Okay. And over the several days that I was shooting, a lot of my lines were taken away by them, mostly given to girls on the set. And at the end of the experience, they tried to take my name off the movie. Uh, I improvised a scene with Terry Garr, who was positively horrible to me. Um, it was one of the most negative experiences one could have uh, ever had earlier in their career. I'm being absolutely honest with you. Sure, that's yeah. I don't think I've ever really said this out loud. And at the end of the thing, they, they said they didn't want to put me in the credits, and I fought for it. And I said, well, I'm in the damn movie, and I'm going to get the residuals, you know, which might result to 43 cents today. And um, Yeah, I'm proud to be in the film, although I think I'm shit in the movie. Um, and uh, I don't think that it's, it was a, the best foot forward for me. It was a very strange experience. I was highly uh, put off by Bill Murray, who was, couldn't have been worse to me, who at the time I think behaved like a psychotic jerk, and I knew a lot of people from Second City. And uh, since then I've learned to you know, separate Bill Murray from, you know, I saw him recently at a, an event, and you know, he nodded at me, I nodded at him. And uh, I've encountered him at several other periods, one of them being Hunter Thompson's uh, funeral in uh, Aspen, Colorado. <laughs> mm, yeah. You know, so, I mean, it's been a long road, you know, and, um, but I was young. I was 22 and a half, 23 at the time, and I got to tell you, um, and I'm being very honest with you, and I'm writing about this, you know, that, you know, that, that was a really, really, um, that was a good, bad experience to go through. <laughs> yeah. Because I was, I was a sort of a, a to be blunt, a sort of middle-class marshmallow kid from Greek kid from Southern Ontario, and I wasn't hardened to the realities of show business. And uh, being in New York City, in Manhattan, watching people shoot a movie and seeing how uh, desperate certain actors were on the set to get their claim to fame, and others like myself who were being garroted and stuffed in the corner, 
said, oh, this is a, this is, can be a nice out game. And it was a really interesting observational experience. It toughened me up. Yeah. Well, I've heard... Uh, you, you... And, 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 and I don't mean to be as blunt about it, because I don't think in any interview I've ever s talked about uh, Tootsie that way. Uh, and then uh, Legally Blonde was a totally different experience insofar as I enjoyed working on the movie, although I found it to be troubling insofar as I thought the director was not treated well by the producers, and I thought they overshot, and I thought they were being incredibly overly careful about how they were shooting stuff. Reese Witherspoon was an entirely... Uh, she was a little bit reserved, but I think she was having difficulties with Ryan Philippe at the time. Okay. And um, what's her name? Uh, what's her name? Of course, uh, Jennifer Coolidge, the great. What's her name? Oh yeah. Um, she uh, she was wonderful. We had a great. I had a great experience. But I had a totally irresponsible manager who blew the billing and didn't even include me in the uh, the end crawl. They were supposed to put me in the end, end crawl of the movie. We didn't negotiate billing properly. And at the uh, end of the day, I was dropped from the billing entirely, much to my shock and horror. So I fired this manager, and uh, like that. So, you know, it's, it's, it's not always a beautiful story there. No. <laughs> well, well, but, there... you know, I'm a survivor, yeah. and I also am one of these guys. I had a mom in London, Ontario. My mother always said, especially, you know, I could have walked across the street, green light, on a beautiful day, and a car could go through the, the stop sign, or the stoplight, and hit me. And my mother would say, what did you do wrong? You know, <laughs> and I could have been doing everything right. So my mother was very careful to make me be cognizant of the fact of even if everything goes right, you've got to make sure you've got to make sure what you do is the best way you can be. <laughs> so after these crummy experiences, I did a pretty thorough postmortem to make sure that the next experience would be different. And I think my IMDB and my career has sort of proven that to be true. Was Thief your first, your very first uh, acting experience? But Pretty much in the movies, yeah. Yeah, that yeah. was with James Caan. Yeah, and again, that was kind of a weird thing. Um, uh, Michael, uh, Michael Mann, who hired me again for, for Miami Vice, an interesting director, but it just, you know, the sequence I did was, was weird, and I, I'm not really much in it you know you find early films like that with a lot of actors is, you know they're just figuring it out okay i was just figuring it out and i was in the sequence with the great del close the director from second city who's now yeah i haven't seen thief but i was looking at your credits and i watched the trailer for it because i hadn't heard of the film yeah. and you well, got we live yeah, kind of in yeah you, you wouldn't see me i mean honestly if the sequence that i'm in is goes by so quickly that, I mean, I don't even see me in it. I think I'm under a car. You know, so it's... It was... Um, it was one of those things that led to other things. I mean, I did Miami Vice as a result of that. And then from Miami Vice, many years later, I did Nash Bridges. So, I mean, it's all interrelated. And for me, it's all part of the process. Because um, the one thing I told my agent when I started doing films in Chicago... A, I wanted to get into the movie business and the film business, and and uh, I like and being in front of the camera. Um, camera time is like flight time. You know, you can rehearse and you can. It's like being on the air for you. Mm -hmm. you, can, you. You can pretend and you can rehearse, but until you're on the air and something goes wrong, or you, that's when you got to know how to. That's what separates the uh, the pros from the non-pros. So being in front of a camera or being in front of a live audience is where you really learn your craft so when I did this TV, TV show Forever Night in Toronto in the late, seven, late 80s 89 um, I did like 48 episodes and I got really comfortable in front of the camera and got to know the camera you know and th that's the real trick for film acting and TV acting okay there's some films here I haven't heard of but I went reading up on them. I definitely am enticed to see them. One of them I have heard of, of course, Vibes, of course, because I loved Cindy Lauper growing up, you know. Um, could you, I have not seen this film, though. It's with her and Jeff Goldblum. You yeah, want to talk um, about you know, that? Ken Kwapis directed it. Uh, I, you know, I haven't seen it since it's come out. Um, I remember it as being a pretty, pretty, um, pretty uh, substandard movie. Did you work with Cindy? No, I worked with um, Jeff Goldblum. Okay. And, um, yeah, I mean, 
Um, it was a it was a movie that didn't work. I mean, there are a bunch of them on my IMDb. You know, you never know what's going to be the winner and what isn't, right? Um, you were you a man. You, you were a man trouble. I was going to say you were man trouble. That was a Bob Rafelson movie with Jack Nicholson. It reteamed everybody who had done Five Easy Pieces, which was a masterpiece. Um, man trouble is not a masterpiece. Okay. And uh, I, I got to tell you, I haven't even watched the movie. So oh. I mean, I tried to watch the film, and I just thought, oof. Um, again, you know, uh, <laughs> you know, there, the, the the vagaries of the film business uh, are such that, you know, a good script can be can be can be uh, can be made to be horrible, and a bad script can be made better. So, what I you know, what I perceive to be is, you know, oh, I know this is going to be a good movie or not. I mean, you just hope for the best and how it all comes together. I mean, that isn't to say that certain scripts are, are you know, aren't brilliant to read and, and others aren't stinkers. But, you know, there are also a lot of variables that, that, that contribute to making both good and bad movies. I mean, we can go through another what I perceive to be the stinkers in my list, which is The Relic. Which oh, I didn't movie. like it either. <laughs> I hated I it. That, I mean, I think that movie is horrible on a lot of levels, and I had to live it. I had to be in it. I got pneumonia in that film. Oh, I, I thought that was such a stupid movie. I wasn't even going to bring it up to you. I thought it was so horrible. No, no, no. I, but I think that you, I think, honestly, to, you know, you should bring up the bad movies as well as the good ones to actors. Yeah. Because sometimes, because to, to be honest, you learn... You know, Hollywood doesn't like failure and it doesn't accept it. But, you know, as a human, um, you know, in all walks of life, I'm sure your audience would concur, you learn a lot more from the things, your mistakes, than you do from your victories. I just remember with the relic, you know, um, one thing that stood out to me is that, you know, uh, the, the dogs go chasing after the relic and then the cops start chasing after it. Look, you just spotted what a mangled body. What makes you think chasing after this thing's going to help you any? Uh, I was, uh, I was like, it was, it was like oh, the, oh, the... That's just the beginning of the dumbness. Uh, yeah. There's this whole sequence where she's running and then she takes off her shoes and then she starts running again. And I said to the director, Peter Himes, who's a real piece of work, I said, well, isn't she going to cut her feet? And he bellows at me across the room, you know, in front of all the other actors, because we were shooting the sequence. He says, when I cut this film together, they're not even going to be thinking about that. You know, you, sort of, you idiot. <laughs> and, and, and then cut, cut to five months later, I didn't even see the movie when it came out. It, it tanked. And I'm sitting in a dollar twenty-five movie theater here in Los Angeles with a buddy of mine. It's in the afternoon. I said, let's go see this piece of whatever. And sitting behind me are ten very old Jewish ladies, right? Yep. They come up to this part of the movie where she takes off her shoes, and the old lady behind me goes, she's going to cut her feet. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought to myself, I had laughed for hours about that, because you can make a $150 million, $250 million, $500 billion movie, but if it doesn't make sense, then it doesn't matter how much it costs or how big the animal is, if Stan Winston does it or any special effects house, it doesn't matter. You no, know, the other thing, too, and the opening on the... Stupid, like my dad said, if they just think you're stupid and they can ignore it. You know. <laughs> I remember they were sending the cops down to the roof part. They the thing ki killed a bunch of them. One they, of those cops. Yeah, they kept sending more cops down. It's like, <laughs> come on. The movie... The movie bears no uh, no uh, real honest criticism because it, it just it just falls under the weight of its own stupidity. Yep. Um, and and you know, uh, I don't know whether the people who were listening to your interview whether this is like any other interview you've had. It, it, I'm, I'm sure people like to be candid. I certainly do. Oh, but, I love know, it when people are. Yeah. But you know, uh, uh, the audience knows it. You know, a, a nine-year-old kid would know the difference between a good movie and a bad movie and they often do so yeah um how the relic and, you know, was not the other joy of working on that movie was with working with this guy i i called on the set all the time more size tom because uh, <laughs> because he uh he was just loathsome to work with tom size more yeah really, honestly uh, you've touched on between him and sean young i don't know who deserves the the medal to have a special room in hell made for them <laughs> 
<laughs> well, I hated the relic. I'll 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 t- I'll tell you that. Well, but... good. You know, I I can hate something I've been in, and I'm with you there. I'll vote. I'll vote on that one. But I I one movie I did see in theaters, and I really liked you, and it was The Deep End of the Ocean. Yeah. Um. There's a really well intentioned good movie, not entirely successful film, and it's an interesting reason why it wasn't successful. Um. The book was really, really, it was one of Oprah's first book club books, Mm -hmm. and uh, it it did phenomenally well. The author is a woman named Jacqueline Mitchard, who's from Madison, Wisconsin, and it was, you know, very highly regarded. It was one of these books read by women, um, and it's about a child, if people don't know, a child is lost and then is returned to a family many years later, but quite changed. Pardon me. It it presents a really kind of uncomfortable reality. You know, what if your child is kidnapped and doesn't want to come back to you? You know, once you found out where they've been kidnapped to another home. And one of the things I loved is that one half of the new ownership <laughs> doesn't know about the kidnapping. You know, and and it right. really presented um, a case of uh, you know you have one parent that of course the the the, that had the kid you know and and lost the kid and then technically speaking there was a parent that was taking care of him but did not know the situation you know right and 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 it's yeah it presented a really problematic and you know very possible real situation yeah and 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 all that all that worked precisely against the movie because the very thing that women felt comfortable reading, for the most part women readers, or mm-hmm. any reader, but not to just, you know, uh, make them as women, but I think the majority of people that read the book was a big, big hit uh, in, in demographically amongst women. And they would be reading it in the safety of their home, with their children perhaps in bed, um, maybe their husband next to them, or whatever, their significant other, and they could put the book down and that's it. But the movie has got a sort of unrelenting quality to it that made people very uncomfortable to watch and hence was not popular. <laughs> mm-hmm. Get my drift? Yeah. You had... And, um, okay. And it was also a, a time when a lot of... You know, Michelle Pfeiffer had signed an independent deal and, and Jessica Lang and all these uh, female film stars were, you know... It was a project of their own sort of creation, and people were saying, well, you know, it doesn't have enough commercial legs. But, but in my estimation, it's a good movie. I get to work with Treat. I got to work with Michelle, who is a real treat. Mm-hmm. And uh, and I mean that without any, um, you know, irony. Mm-hmm. And also Ulu Grossbard, a uh, great, 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 great film director. Yeah. So... I'm proud of that film. It's it's a, a minor miss in my opinion. Um, it's it's a movie that uh, I hold in well regard, high regard. You know, it's no it's no the relic I call the smellic. <laughs> yeah, that might be your worst, the relic. <laughs> oh no, I think that there might be a few others, but I don't think you've seen them. Well, I got uh, another four titles I got listed here that caught my attention. And they sound interesting. Maybe they're not in your book. I know a couple of them had Judge Reinhold in them, and I like Judge Reinhold. Um, I think one was Head Office, and one was Off Beat. Were those the two with Judge Reinhold? Yeah, Head Head Office uh, was. I actually played two parts in that. Okay. Um, because they ran, they didn't, they needed an actor for another part, and I said, I'll do it. <laughs> okay. Give me a different makeup. Um, yeah, it's it's it's. Um, a Ken Finkelman movie. Ken went on to do a, a show in Canada, uh, The Newsroom, which is kind of a, a very, how should I put it, um, almost like a very, um, like The Office, very sort of straight take on uh, kind of a, not straight take, but a very tongue-in-cheek take on a, on a, on a newsroom. Okay. But um, I'm, I'm trying to think of what else Ken has done that you might know. But it's it, head office is has got its moments. Okay, it's got its moments. Do you like working um, with Judge Ryan? It's got it's got a good cast. Uh, yeah. Rick Moranis is in it. Okay, and uh, who's very funny in it, and uh, a few others. 
Um, I mean, a lot of other Eddie Arnold. Uh, uh, I mean, uh, Eddie Albert from Green Acres. Oh yeah, Roman and, Holiday. Uh, yeah, from Roman Holiday, of course. Yeah. And um, you know, a lot of really good actors in there. Um, he, one of them who just died, um, who did Diduva, George, uh, uh, not George Gaines, but George. Uh, he's in the original original cast of Saturday Night Live. Um, oh. The Duva is a short film called The Dove, which is a takeoff of a, a Ingmar Ing, Ingmar Bergman movie. Um, I'm missing the name. George Coe. Okay. C O E. Um, look him up. He's very very funny. And if you could see the Duva, it might be on YouTube or something. Okay. But um, uh, yeah, and it's it's and oh, Danny DeVito's in it. Um, so it's got it's got a big cast in it. Jane Seymour, I think, is in it. Okay. Um, of course, Judge is in it. It's about, you know, corporate America, office politics and stuff. Uh, it's, it's meant to be a um, black comedy. It, 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 um, it misses the mark. And then the other one you mentioned was um, Offbeat, which I, re- I reversed the words. Um, <laughs> <laughs> was that with Judge Reinhold? I'm not going to say that one on TV or on, on <laughs> Whatever on whatever <laughs> medium medium we might be on. Um, <laughs> that said, uh, it's one of those films which is a process film. In other words, I got to work with Michael Dinner, who directed it, and Michael uh, and I just worked together on Justified a few years ago. Okay, yeah. And, and so we'd had a long relationship, and and uh, um, you know, it's an interesting movie, Offbeat, because. Uh, it's got uh, Jacques D'Amboise and his dance company. It's got Joe Mantegna's in it. It's got a lot of really good actors, and it's uh, Penn Gillette's in it. Uh, it was shot in New York in the 80s. Um, it has a certain vibe to it that uh, that I remember, um, but it's, you know, one of these comedies that sort of, you know, didn't work. So, um, How about My Man Adam? Boy, um, <laughs> there's a comedy that doesn't work. Um, uh, but you know, uh, missed opportunity. Raphael's Barge is the is the uh, is in it. I think Dave Thomas is in it from Second City. And what's her name? Um, um, Cartwright. Uh, is it Angela? Oh, Cartwright? Ver- oh, Veronica Cartwright. Veronica Cartwright from L.A. Law, and then she was the the kid in. Uh, in the birds. Yeah, and Alien and Invasion of the Body Snatchers. And... Hello, hello, you know your stuff. So yeah. she was in it. Yeah. And uh, we shot it in San Diego. It was it was supposed to be this sort of quirky 80s, you know, a John Hughes inflected comedy. Um, and uh, I don't even know whether it got released. I don't think it's available. But what the funny thing is, I think it was called Inside Adam Swit. And then it became My Man Adam. And the funny thing is, the other day, I've got uh, boxes of VHS tapes that I'm getting rid of and I'm transcribing. And I actually have a copy of the movie. Okay. So um, if you're a good boy, maybe one day I'll send it to you. Okay. All right. <laughs> just don't send... How's that for your audience? I didn't mean to send that condescending. J- just don't send me the relic. <laughs> no, no. The smell like you can... You'll smell it from miles away and you'll just have to dump it in the, the Atlantic nearby. The last one I want to ask you about that I got listed here is All's Fair. Again, haven't seen it, but I know Sally Kellerman and a bunch of uh, actors are in it. Well, you're you're bringing up, you know, you're bringing up all the the uh, the the, uh, the ones that have a great uh, aroma to them. That one was another um, horrible movie, <laughs> um, and this is a movie that George Siegel was in. Okay, with Sally Kellerman. And the original reason I was going to do the movie, because it was a comedy, was because Charles Durning was going to do the part that George Siegel ended up doing. Okay. And the reason why Charles Durning couldn't do the part is because they couldn't insure him because he was too corpulent, too um, overweight. And uh, so at the last minute he bailed, and they brought in George Siegel, who is interesting, and I know George, and you know, his career is actually, you know, enjoyed a resurgence since then but this was at a low point in his life and career and it wasn't probably the best time for him and uh 
Jane Kaczmarek is in it. Um, you know, Jane Kaczmarek from Malcolm in the Middle, and then, uh, you know, uh, so the, the, there are people that are in the movie. Who else is in it? Um, oh, yeah, uh, Blake Edwards' daughter is in it. Um, you there? Yeah, I'm there. Uh, um, I, 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 I have. I thought I was talking, talking yeah. to myself. <laughs> Actually, I'm just th- trying to think because these are movies I listed. I read their synopsis well, and I was like, um, yeah. Like Edward's daughter. Yeah, oh, oh, she's in it. Um, uh, lovely lady. Yeah. Um, you know, um, uh, I don't know whether she's a you know an actress, but she was acting in the film, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and directed by a guy named Rocky Lang, um, and just. Um, um uh, and I'll tell you a, a story about that off camera sometime or off off tape um because it's too off color okay but, uh, the the film was just you know a nothing ex- an, a, a nothing film uh it was about a group of people that went out on the weekend and got involved in these sort of paint uh, paint wars you know uh you know uh, a like paintball paintball game it was about a uh, the sort of neighborhood people that decide to get into this paintball game and it gets turns into a game of war and it was just um it's not good <laughs> right it's not good but you know again they sometimes they work and sometimes they don't and it really you know it really you know because the script for that actually was quite funny but it kind of fell apart I um, but you reminded me of something when you asked about that movie yeah you're not asking about. Oh, I did a film in in New Brunswick, or I mean, sorry, in Nova Scotia, called the um, the. Um, oh come on, John, uh, with with. Uh, you can look it up on my IMDb, with um, Ed Burns. Called the. Oh. Uh, oh come on, John. Now, if you have my IMDb in front of you, no. Well, I'm going to click on her and see what I can get. Let me see. Meanwhile, I'll sing some songs for my new album. Well, you can uh, tell me what it was. Uh, you did, did do a film uh, with Fran Drescher. What was she like? I did a TV show with Fran Drescher. Okay. Fran is, this is before her big success. We did a spinoff of uh, Who's the Boss? Okay. And uh, Fran Drescher and Donna Dixon, who was, then, who was Dan Aykroyd's wife. Yep. And um and uh it didn't really go anywhere. <laughs> it was um it was a spin-off. It was going to be a, a sitcom. It didn't uh, it didn't go anywhere. Um and uh, I'm trying to think, is, is it called The Rivers not The Rivers Edge. Um Oh, just a second. I'll find what what year did it come out, do you know? Uh I think we shot it in the in the 90s. I know we shot it in the 90s. I'm just trying to think when and you shot in Nova Scotia. It's handy to where I am. Yeah, that's what I'm saying in Halifax. I mean, if you want to bring up a movie, that's a really good movie. Although I can't remember the title. And um, Nick Willing is a director. And Ed Burns is in it. And uh, I'm... My goodness, John. We'll be back with more of... Can't remember my own... Movie. Well, uh, yeah. if it was from the 90s, okay, uh, the ones we haven't talked about here, we, Defenselessness, uh, Guilty you know, of Sin. Defenseless with Barbara Hershey and J.T. Walsh. Yeah. Uh, not a bad movie. It's directed by the director who made a lot of uh, James Bond movies after that. Yeah. Uh, Guilty of Sin, that you did in the, that in the 90s. Uh, the mm-hmm. Shadow. Uh, the Shadow? I mean, you know, there's another missed opportunity, a really big budget movie that uh, didn't work. Alec Baldwin. Yeah. Uh, the sequence that I'm in at the beginning is great, but you know, great sequences don't. Are you saying that the uh, camera setups, 98 camera setups, <laughs> two two weeks to shoot? Are you saying uh, that this Goes was by a, in about a minute and a half on screen? Are you saying this was a film or a TV show? The Shadow. Was, yeah, though that was shot up here. Um, it was the River King. That's what it's called. The River King. Ah, finally, the title comes back to me. The River King, shot in Nova Scotia, with Ed Burns. Okay. And Jennifer L., who is in uh, Pride and Prejudice. Her eel, maybe you pronounce her name. E H L E. It's all coming back to me now, and I'm not even in front of my computer. So. I'll have to go up. I was looking on Wikipedia. 
And I don't even have it listed for you there. No, it, w it would be on my IMDb. Oh, okay. All right. The River yeah. King. The River King. And then, um, then I've shot in. Uh, I've shot. Uh, you know, I shot the last uh, three episodes of Republic of Doyle in Newfoundland. Okay. Um, I've shot also uh, a few things in Newfoundland. So. Have you ever been in I, New, I, in New Brunswick? Well, I, I, you know, I um, when I was a teenager, I hitchhiked through New Brunswick, and I stayed at the university, uh, and I uh, in the dorm room and spent three nights there hitchhiking through New Brunswick. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so that's in nineteen seventy something, seventy one or two. Yeah, I'm um, seeing the River King listed here. You played Joey Tosh. Yeah, it's a good movie, actually. Okay. And. Um, you know, there are some movies that are, you know, uh, unfortunately, like there's a movie I called Everybody Wants to Be Italian that's, that I think, you know, is a really good film if you, people want to see that one. Okay. Um, and I did a film up in Canada called Croon uh, in, in uh, Victoria, B.C. Okay. Which, if people can find that one, it's a really good one. Um, you know, and I did a movie many years ago in, in Nova Scotia called The Bruce Curtis Story. Okay. Um they found a real story about this kid that gets involved in the killing in in New, New, in New Brunswick. No, in Nova Scotia. Maybe it was in New Brunswick, but I, we shot it in Nova Scotia, and um, that's a good movie. Um, there, are, you know, a lot of these smaller ones go by the way. You know. Um, well, you know what it reminds me of. A um, couple. Uh, no, it was last year. I went to my first movie nine times. I went to. Uh, Richard Linkletter's Everybody Wants Some, nine times. I loved it. I loved it. I even loved the soundtrack album. It just took me it's back. It's a great movie. Loved it. Went to it nine times. There were people working at the theaters that looked at me like I had two heads. And I looked at them and I said, <laughs> if I was seeing the latest blockbuster, you guys wouldn't bat an eye. But because I'm seeing something that you folks don't understand... You, yeah. you 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 wonder why I went and saw it. they 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 said what why are you going to that nine times it was a great movie you know I, yeah no it, it, it's it, I get it I get it yeah and I I got the soundtrack album you know it just took me back you know because I, I was born in 1972 so I grew up with a lot of the stuff that they were dealing with and a lot of the music yeah, it's funny it's a good film. Yeah, loved it. And uh, I think, to me, one of Linkletter's best. He probably won't be known for that, but I think it'll definitely become, become a cult film uh, uh, down the line. I mean, I really line. dig Boyhood, but I think he's, 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 all his films are great. All his films. Oh, yeah, absolutely. He did an American Masters on him. Okay. Um, uh, which is a series here in the U.S. about the great American artists. And uh, they did one on Richard Linkletter. Oh, yeah. Well, I loved Everybody Wants Some, one of my favorite movies in the last five years, and uh, I thought it was very underappreciated, but I think critics loved it, and I definitely loved it, you know, and I did two interviews from it, too, so, and they were, the people I interviewed from it were quite happy I saw it nine times, so. Right. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, but you say that, and you, you mentioned some of these films that you're really proud of, and, and I say I, ha I hadn't heard of, of them, and it's like, it's sad when there's really good movies that don't get heard of, and then there's garbage like The Relic <laughs> that you wish people would not hear of. Well, but, you know, you realize, um, you realize at the end of the proverbial day that the film business and the television business and all of it is, you know, related to eyeballs, ratings, reviews, the amount of a corporate backup it has like the relic was a big movie from was it paramount you know it, it, it gets the sort of the spitball treatment of you know let's throw it up against the wall and whether it sticks or not and a lot of these films just don't get that opportunity i i mean i was at tiff and toronto film festival for several years it's running currently um you know there are a lot of really great movies that never will see the light of day distribution wise um fact of life Sad, yeah, I think that um, there's an element of that, um, and I think that for the most part, right now, the United States American films are, in my opinion, at an all-time low. But um, you know, uh, in terms of you know what I do, I just have to keep on doing it. You can't be judgmental at the time you're doing something, although you tried, you know, you hope that it's the greatest thing in the world. But you know, when I'm doing 
something that's a stinker, I don't know what's a stinker. Yeah. You know. And, um, you know, you, you kind of put your faith in others, and, you know, that's it. Um, so you, you look back at it in retrospect, you know, it's, it's kind of like, you know, you can look back at a week and go, boy, Tuesday was horrible. You know, but I didn't think of it at the time. It was going to be a bad day, but it's a bad day, right? Yeah. And um, it's just the, the nature of it. They can't all be great. Um, but I've been fortunate too. You know, I've been fortunate to uh, to keep it to keep it going. And that's I think that's the real key. You know, is to keep it going. Whether you uh, keep employed in this film or that film. You know, I have a lot of friends of mine that. They get stopped. They get paralyzed by either success or failure. Because both of them can be paralytic. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Well, I'm going to tell you, John, that um, before we close off, I just wonder, do you have any charities that you're involved in or a website you want to plug on here? Well, we have a family member that's got myotonic dystrophy. Okay. And... um we had a benefit recently in London, Ontario, and if people would go online and look at uh, my uh, cousin's son's name is William Singeris. That's S-I-N-G-E-R-I-S. Okay. And there's a myotonic dystrophy fund set up in his name, and if anybody wants to contribute to that, it's a pernicious disease. It's basically, from what I understand, it's like muscular dystrophy, except you're born without the ability to make any muscles. So William, who's now 13 years old, was basically born without the ability to make any muscle. And he can't move, walk. Okay. Very difficult to talk. But he still, you know, exists. He's got a brain. He's functioning. He's a human being. He's a sentient being. And, um, you know, what doctors thought 13 years ago wouldn't sustain a person, he wouldn't live beyond a year, you know, he's living a long, healthier life. It's a pernicious, pernicious illness, a disease, whatever, and uh, myotonic dystrophy, M-Y-O-T-O-N-I-C-D-Y-S-T-R-O-P-H-Y, two words. Okay. And um, that's what I would look up, William Singeris, or just look up for the Myotonic Dystrophy Association of Canada. And, you know, I have a very dear friend right now who's volunteering for the Red Cross in Florida, um, I regret that I didn't do that, but, you know, I think that it's always good to give your time. And yes. You know, um, I've been a volunteer for the Red Cross myself, and it's one of the most gratifying things I've ever done as an adult. Yes. Period. So um, I, I just implore people to get involved in their communities and to to not be so judgmental and, and develop more empathy. True, yes, Absolutely. And that's my word to the wise. (laughs) Well, you know, if you send me a message um, uh, to my email in response, uh, the name of that disease and the name of the uh, place, I would make, I'd gladly make a a donation in your honor. Well, we will, um, I I will definitely do that. I will send it to you forthwith. I will, I will make a, you got my word on it. I'll make a donation for you in your honor. Well, our family would be indebted. We raised some money earlier this year and you know um you know william's william's struggling as a person and he's he's a human it's a difficult life but uh you know he's got a lot of love and he's got a lot of support yes absolutely medical and otherwise well you you send me the information i'll I'll make a donation uh i'll uh get that out so other people can hear about it as well because excellent yeah because this is the first time i've heard of it so there you go well I'll, i'll pass it along to you let me uh, give me a day on that because I'm going to get the, all the proper information from my cousin, and then I'll email it to you within within the day. Okay. What I'll do is I'll just send you an email, and uh, you know you can just respond to it. You know, and no, I, I, I have your email because I just got, saw you going. Hey, I've been trying to get in touch with you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know. <laughs> you, we're a little late getting started here tonight. <laughs> oh, I'm so sorry, but you know, and I just emailed you back. But you know, I would love to do that, and and I implore all your people out there that listen. You know, to um, to you know, to realize how you know, if indeed we are lucky, then t- to realize your your uh, healthfulness and luck by helping other people. Absolutely, absolutely. 
Well, well, John, I thank you for the honor of coming on my show tonight. Like, oh, it, come on, honor, schmoner. I, I <laughs> am honored. You know, you were you were the janitor yeah. in the Breakfast Club that. Uh, you were the wisest yeah. one in the film. <laughs> and of course, well, I appreciate the time that we spent, and, uh, and you know, and maybe we'll do it again. Yeah, and I loved your bluntness too. Like e- even the times when you said you didn't like certain projects or certain people. I like it when people are are, are direct with you know. And uh, I I I think this was well, a. There's a lot of BS in show business, and there's yeah. a lot of there's a lot of you know. Um, masking what people are Mm -hmm. and the one thing that you realize I believe in life is that the truth comes out about everybody so you know well before you whether it's my truth or whatever (laughs) but there's a certain truth that comes out about people yeah and uh, you know I'm not purporting to say that I know the truth about these people but it's my according to the way I saw it so well, before you go, would you mind doing a plug for my show? Of course not. Yeah. Just just state your name and uh, say you're listening to Greg Gilbert on Python's Paradise in New Brunswick, Canada. You okay. Got, you got all that? Python's Paradise? Yep. That's the name of the show, yep. Hi, I'm John Kapalos. You are listening to Greg Gilbert on Python's Paradise in New Brunswick, Canada, or as I like to call it, Kenyatta. <laughs> Thank you so much, John, and God bless you. And uh, and back at you. Yes, and uh, good luck to you and everything you pursue. Great. Thank you. And, and let me know when it airs and, and uh, give me a link and all that stuff. I will do so. Okay. Take care, man. Yep. Bye. bye.